I want to say uh, welcome to everyone for uh, joining us here today at Crosspoint and big weekend in Mason County with eighth grade dance and prom and my Facebook feed was steady pictures of that, so thank you all for that. Um, there's this been interesting thing that I've noticed, and um, some of you who have parents who are parents of daughters, especially younger kids, I'm sure you can empathize with this as well. Then um, for some reason, I don't know what it is, so I have three little girls who are four and under, and that um, when people talk to me about them in terms of their future, um, they almost talk about it as if it's an illness, if that makes sense. <laughs> That it's like when prom comes up, people just be like, oh, your day's coming. Your day's coming. And it's like, like am I going to die? Like, is that what's happening? And like, that's almost how the conversation goes. And so it's funny just to hear that over and over again. And um, when people, when they mention something like that, like, oh, yeah, it's coming. Don't worry. It's great. <laughs> and it's like, thank you. It was so encouraging. I'm so excited about all that. And I usually respond to that like, don't worry, like, I have enough issues of my own right now. Like, I'm sure, yeah, that'll be there someday. But right now, I'm just trying to work through it. So um, we've had this issue. I, it's kind of a never-ending issue. And I'm sure you who have, are parents of older kids, you'll go, yeah, it's never-ending. But um, I am constantly trying to find new and creative ways to get my children to behave right now. And especially right now, our two-year-old is the one who we're having, and I know that's not shocking, but she's the one we're having the most trouble trying to get her to behave. And so um, we recently, she is um, mostly potty trained, which is an exciting process. And so as we've been going through the potty train thing, she's done fantastic. But over the past couple of weeks, she keeps having accidents while in the bathroom. And we couldn't figure this out. And um, on the plus side, I will hand this to her, she cleans it up herself, which is... <laughs> It's kind of awesome. So, like, she has an accident, and then all of a sudden, like, she'll go upstairs to go to the bathroom. She'll come back downstairs, and she'll have no pants and different panties on. And it's like, do you have an accident? Yeah, I did. I cleaned it up. Um, I realized, though, that what she does is she takes the towel off the rack, <laughs> cleans up the floor, and then she puts the towel back on the rack. <laughs> and so we had to, we had to clear, like, I just maybe put the towel in the sink as well. Thank you very much. We found that out the hard way, just to be clear. <laughs> um... But we couldn't figure out why she kept having accidents. Because it was like, we thought, like, does she not know how to, like, unbutton her pants? Is she getting stuck? Because it was always, it was like, never downstairs, never outside. It was always like she was in the bathroom. And then the other day, this is really bad. Um, <laughs> not that the other part wasn't bad, but this is really bad. Is I was going up the steps, and she's standing in the bathroom. And she's kind of got her legs straddled out. And... She's got her pants down, ready to go, thinks she's going to go potty, and she's got her kind of hand down around her knees, and she starts urinating in her hand. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I just looked at her, and I was like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> and, um, and she had no explanation, which I still don't know to this day what was happening, but apparently this has been the problem for quite a while. Not that, not that she couldn't make it to the bathroom, not any of these other things, just that she thought it'd be more fun to pee in her hand. <laughs> it was just like, what do you do? And so, um, so we try, as a parent, we, we've tried all these different like discipline things. Like, okay, so what are we going to do to get her to actually behave? And, and this has been like an ongoing thing for the duration of her life, and I know it'll continue. And so we've tried, like, all the creative things. Like, we tried time out. Uh, that doesn't really work because she entertains herself, and that's not a problem. We tried counting, and we never really, like, said, like, when we're done counting, this is the discipline thing, which we realized we should have. Like, when I get to three, it means this will happen. And so the problem was, like, we'd start counting, like, one, two, three, four. Like, okay, I'm it's really hard to like stay mad when they're counting with you and go like, yeah, we're counting. This is great. And so, um, and so it's just like we're trying to constantly figure out what's going to work. And so the one that we have used recently, which has actually worked really well, is we've started to let our kids to discipline themselves, which I know that sounds like, what are you doing? Like, that's crazy. That'll never work. But this is what we've actually found has happened, is that they have this decent understanding of right and wrong, and that when we put it to them, they're actually relatively fair. And so one of them bit another one of my children the other day, and so it was just like, I wanted to, like, I'm so mad, and what do I do? And I was like, what do you think should happen? I think I should go to timeout. You're right, you should. <laughs> For how long? 
and they have no concept of time. So it was like, uh, for four hours. <laughs> okay, four hours. <laughs> you think about what you've done. <laughs> but, um, but it's been fascinating, because like, it really, and I'm sure it'll eventually not work. It goes in cycles. But for right now, it really has, because they kind of have a moral compass, and they're relatively fair. Now, to be clear, I don't want like our court system to adopt this. <laughs> like, uh, they're like, you stole this. What do you think should happen? I think they should give me more. <laughs> like, okay, so we're not taking this on as a society. But for the relationship of me and my kids, it's actually been pretty effective. And what I find fascinating is that Jesus actually used the same method. That sometimes, instead of like just spouting off rules and spouting off punishments and spouting off disciplinary actions, sometimes he lets us judge ourselves. Now, this is what's fascinating, is Jesus, if you don't believe anything else about him, you need to at least believe that he was a masterful teacher, that he was an amazing teacher. Like, what he does is he takes um, his, like, people, the Hebrew people, they had the Old Testament, which is the kind of a collection of writings before Jesus. This is the length of the Old Testament. It's like two-thirds of the Bible. And what he does is in the Old Testament, there are 613 different commands, and he boils it down to two. Like, that, that's quite a summary. Like, that's quite the cliff notes that you can find. He takes all these different things and he goes, hey, it comes down to this. Love God, love people. That's what it's all about. And, and then we see that, like, complex issues would come up in his day and age. And people would go, how do you make sense of it? How do you do this? And he'd always have this, like, incredible story to tell. And he's like, well, it's like this. And he'd tell the story and everybody would be like, oh. And granted, there were sometimes people were like, what does that mean? But he, he just did incredible things. And, and then we see there's four different times, four different times in his life that he kind of stops and he goes to people, what do you think? You decide. And every single time he does this, there, there's something significant that's happening in the moment. Is He's not trying to teach him anything new. He's not trying to like go, oh, you take all these complex things together and it comes down to this. No, what he does is very simple. He goes, hey, there's a gap between what we all know is true and what we actually do. That there's a gap between what we believe and how we act. And it, the couple different times, four different times, when he notices this gap and people are asking questions, he just goes this, he goes, hey, what do you think? What do you think about this? And this morning, we're going to look at one of those passages. And what we're going to do today, I think is going to be very interesting um, but I think it could also be a little bit cutting, if we could say it like that. Because like them, we are very much like them, not a lot has changed over 2,000 years, that for us, we often have a gap between what we believe and how we act, between what we think is true and what we actually do in our lives. And so this is what I'm going to do today. I'm hopefully going to put you in the same position that Jesus put his listeners in his day. And I'm just going to go, hey, what do you think? You, right now, you are your own judge. No one else is judging you. No one else is thinking about you. I'm saying this partially as a waiver. You should not be thinking about anyone else during this moment. You should only be thinking about yourself. But I want you to see for yourself, hey, what do you think? How, how would I respond to myself in this? So with that said, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. No, we're not in Matthew chapter 20. Sorry, my slide is wrong. We're in Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 28. I apologize for that. So Matthew 21, starting in verse 28. And this is how it starts. Jesus says, what do you think? And that's a, just, a, just as one final prep, you're going to have to think. Okay? I can't, I can't just go... Here it is. There you go. No, you're actually going to have to think over the next 30 minutes that we have together. So what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. Now, we don't know specifically what his job was. We can assume that the son knew exactly what he was supposed to do. So he just says, hey, go, son. You're kind of my responsibility. I'm in authority over you. Go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. This is, again, this is very simple. I'm, I'm not trying to make this more complex. I just want to make sure we're tracking with it. So father comes to the son, 
Son, I want you to go work. The son actually gives a shocking answer. I will not. Like, dads, how would we respond if our 12-year-old son told us that? Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> like, that's what, almost what we'd expect the father to say in that moment. But he, he's telling the story. And so the son, the son kind of defies the father. But then it says he changed his mind. Um, another way that we could translate that phrase, changed his mind, is he repented. He turned and went the other direction. So you could read it as, the son said, I will not, but then he repented and he went. And so that's the encounter with the first son. Second son, not much more confusing. Verse 30, then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. So he said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. Went and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. So he makes a request of his son which the son would be expected to carry out. The son says, yeah, absolutely, I will. But then he does nothing. Now, we don't know what happens in the gap there. A lot of things could have happened. Um, he could have forgotten, which I'm sure many of us have done. I'm sure you used that excuse with your parents over and over again. I told you to do this. I'm sorry. I forgot. Or you're like, well, I kind of deliberately forgot because I didn't want to do it. But hey, still, by the end, I forgot. Um, so that could have been it. He could have just gone, you know, I really don't want to do this. Like, I told him yes, but some things are happening, and I, I think I just want to stay here. But either way, what happens is he gives him the affirmative answer, the answer that he wants at first, and then he does nothing. And then Jesus asks this question, verse 31, which of the two did what his father wanted? And just to be clear, so we're on the same page as them, which would you say? Yeah, the first. Of course. <laughs> like, this is obvious. And it, it's funny when I, when I read some passages of the Bible, because we expect Jesus, because he is, he is the master teacher. He is incredible. We expect sometimes in these passages that if we don't get more out of it, that we must have missed something. Because, like, you read that and you're just like, well, duh. <laughs> Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> Stunning insight. No, we, we have all these phrases that go along with us. We say, like, actions speak louder than words. And that's what it comes down to. Like, yeah, we would much rather someone carry out what we wanted them to do, even if they resisted at first, than to tell us that they were going to do something and then end up doing nothing. And so their answer is the same as ours. They go, the first. And I think they're kind of asking this. What are you getting at, Jesus? And then he says this next. I want to read it. This is important. This happens directly after. So this is continuing the discussion. The first they answered, and this is, Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even... After you saw this, that's an important phrase, even after you saw this, you did not repent or changed his mind. You did not repent and believe him. And this is what happens when I, when I read this passage the first time. It kind of feels like Jesus threw us a curveball out of nowhere, right? It's like, nice story, son who doesn't want to obey, then obeys, then a son who wants to obey, but then doesn't obey. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, what are you talking about there? All of a sudden, tax collectors and prostitutes and the kingdom of God and the prophet John, like, how are all these things coming together? I, I didn't, I still don't understand. And um, it's really important to understand this because this teaching, this section, even though if you have a Bible, it has a little heading and it cuts it off, it's part of a larger discussion. And so I just want to give you what happens before it. Um, you can read this on your own time, but basically this is what happens. Is this group of religious leaders, they come up to Jesus, and they just ask him. They see him healing. They see him teaching. They see him giving all these commands. And they ask him, by whose authority are you doing this? By whose authority are you doing all these things? And this is what they're looking for. If you say it's by God then that means you're the son of God. And they wanted to crucify him because they viewed that as blasphemy for anyone to claim to be the son of God. Now, Jesus later on makes that claim, but he knew that when he made that claim, they would crucify him, and he wasn't ready for that yet. So the first one they were looking for was from God. And the other possible answer would have been, he could have said, by man. 
Man is the one who gave me this authority. Now, they were the religious leaders. And so that would mean that Jesus was underneath their authority, and he had to do what they told him to do. And so it's this huge question that he's doing all these different things, and they go, hey, by whose authority? Are we going to crucify you, or do we get to tell you what to do? Now, now we know the answer. It's God, right? Like, that's the one who gave Jesus authority. That's why he was able to do miracles and incredible things, because man does not have the, that authority. Only God does. And so that was the right answer. But Jesus doesn't answer him, which I think is brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. And he does this. He goes, okay, I'll tell you. But first, you have to answer a question for me. And he goes, by whose authority was John baptizing? Now, now John is this prophet who came, and, and the description of John is that he's like a voice in the wilderness, that he came before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. And so what he's doing, the work of John, is he is shifting the people's focus from the religious institutions of his day to prepare their hearts to follow God. And the people loved John. Like the people thought John was amazing because they saw he had authority. They saw that he had power, that there was something significant about him. The religious leaders, not such a big fan because they couldn't control him. They couldn't tell him what to do. And so they didn't like John. And so Jesus asked him, he goes, okay, you want to ask me this difficult question? I know the answer, but let me ask you a question first. We'll see if you answer that. Whose authority was John baptizing? And they kind of huddle up together. They kind of, this is kind of the biblical subnote. Like, hey, could we have a second? They kind of, blah, 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 blah. And, and this is the discussion. Like, hey, if we say from God, then that's not going to work because all the people are going to follow him. But if we say it's from man, then the people are going to want to kill us because they love John. And so they kind of go, we can't answer because either way incriminates us. There's nothing we can do. And so they go back to Jesus and they go, we don't know. And Jesus goes, well, then I'm not going to tell you. Now, this discussion, although it may seem irrelevant to the story that we just told and the question that Jesus asked, is incredibly significant because this is what the people are doing. When they come to Jesus and they have this specific question, by whose authority are you doing this? What they are attempting to do is they are attempting to pin Jesus down on all his beliefs and all his thoughts and ideas. And they're doing something that we often find ourselves doing over and over again, is we are trying to constantly place God in a category. We're constantly trying to figure God out so that we can manipulate him and make him work for us. And, and I've seen people, they, they do things like this. They'll say like, okay, so you have a difficult situation that you need God to act. And, and they'll put it together like a formula. Like, this is what you need to do. If you fast and pray and believe and then cry out to God, then he'll do whatever you ask. It's like, is that really how it works? Is that how things go along? Is God up in heaven like, oh, they didn't fast. I mean, they pray, they believe, they ask it, but I'm not doing anything until they fast it. Oh, they're fasting now. Okay, I guess I have to. There you go. You get what you want. And, and that's what these guys are doing in this moment. They're constantly going, hey, God, this is how you have to act. Jesus, this is how you have to operate. And we try to reduce God and take him down to a formula. We try to put God in a box so that we can contain him and so that we can know exactly what he's doing. And here's the problem with that, is that God can't be contained. While his personality and his character are predictable, because he doesn't change in that way, how he acts, how he operates, when he acts, constantly changes. It constantly moves, and it constantly shifts with the culture. And God is continuing. He says over and over again throughout Scripture, I am doing a new thing. I am going to do a new thing. Now, it doesn't mean he's not loving. It doesn't mean he's not gracious. And it doesn't mean he's not kind. He is all those things. But he will continue to act in ways that are new. Now, for many people, this is troubling. Because we want to go, I want a God who I can make him do what I want. Like, I want to be the puppet master and God be the puppet, and I want things to operate that way. And it doesn't work. And that's what Jesus calls out for them. And this is the fascinating thing. Um, let me come back to just the very end of this story real quickly. 
And he says this at the end. So this is kind of the tail end of verse 31. He says, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. See, this is the situation that they find themselves in. Is that for these religious leaders, there was a time, there was a time that they followed God. There was a time that they loved God. And then they stopped. And we don't know what happened. We don't know if they got too focused on the rules. We don't know if they had a bad experience. We don't know if a relationship fell apart. We don't know their story. But we do know that collectively as a group, they quit. And at one point in time, they eventually said, well, this is how God works. This is how God has operated. So I'm going to stay right here. This is a troubling thing. What do you do when you understand that God is consistently moving, but you begin to recognize that you are constantly standing still? Like, that's hard. Because God is. He's changing. He's doing different things all the time. But what do you do when you realize that in your relationship with him, you have been standing perfectly still? And you realize that, you know what, there are times that you're in step with God. There are times that you feel his presence. There are times that you are actively following him. But you realize that for the most part, all that you're trying to do is pin God down so he can operate how you want him to operate and act how you want him to act. Um, this is what I find. And um, I find it true of myself. And so my guess is that it's true of all of us in some way, form, or fashion. I do a great job of telling God how I followed him in the past. Not presently, not today. I do a great job of showing God my faithfulness that happened 5, 10, or 15 years ago. But for today, I just want him to do what I want. For this moment, for this struggle, for this problem, I just want him to act in the way that's easiest for me. This is, this is what my guess is for some of you. Is that for some of you, you go, wow, that's my story. That's where I am. If you were to ask me to describe my relationship with God five years ago, I would have said it was fantastic. Today, I'm just running on fumes. Like where it was then, yeah, I was full. I, was, I felt like, I was, like my prayer life was incredible. I was, I was growing. I was following. I was taking risks. I was doing all those things that we equate with faith. Now, I'm just kind of going through the motions. And I wonder, and I struggle with, why is he not acting? Why don't I feel him? Why is this not happening? And it's because God continues to move, but I'm still here. For those of you who are not there, and you're just going, no, no, that's not, my faith is like, it's brand new, it's exciting, it's great. Um, consider this as a caution to you. That that's going to happen. Like, you're going to get there. I don't want to say it's unavoidable, but it is probably going to happen that we all go through those cycles in, like in any other relationship or any other areas of our lives. Times when it seems great, times when it struggles, times when we're actively focusing on it, and times that it becomes something on the back burner, that it simply becomes background noise. And so it happens. But the question that Jesus has that he points out so significantly, that he goes to us and it makes it so obvious, which son did what the father wanted? And I think this is so important. Which son did what the father wanted? Was it the one who said he was going to go and then didn't? Or the one who said he was going to do nothing and then did it anyway? Let me ask you. Are you the second son? Are you the second son? Are, are you somebody who, when you realize that something is out of step in your life, even though immediately you may go, oh, no, 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 that's not me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. Do you have the courage to recognize it and make adjustments? 
Or are you like the first son? Who, if anything, I could describe his response as hasty. This is like father goes, hey, we did. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Does, does that happen to you? Do you find different spots in your life when someone says, hey, we need to change this, we need to do that, we need to make this correction? And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. No change. Nothing ever happens. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. We all know. We all know. No matter where you are, no matter where you find yourself this morning, that the second son, although he delayed his obedience, he still changed his mind, repented, and turned to the Father and did what he wanted. And so this is what I want to do today, is um, I want to ask you a couple questions. And, um, and I cannot answer these for you, okay? You are the judge. You're in the seat. It's your life. Okay, but I, I want to ask you a couple questions. Um, but before we get to that, I, I want to read you one passage that the Apostle Paul wrote that I think is absolutely fantastic, and I think it speaks to where we are now. He says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own, but each of you to the interests of the others. And I want to go back to that first line and point some stuff out to you. He says this. If you have any encouragement, any comfort, any common sharing, any tenderness and compassion, he goes, then make my joy complete. And what Paul says, I think, speaks so brilliantly to what Jesus is saying in this moment. We have a tendency in our lives to compartmentalize God. And we want to put God in a category and say, this is how you have to operate, and you get to operate in this area of my life. But Paul here, he says something brilliant. He says, if God is worth anything, then he has to be worth everything. If God is worth, like, if you see, like, anything in your life that you're going, yes, this is Jesus, this is the Spirit, this is God acting, this is where I can see him working. If you see that anywhere, then you must also come to the con conclusion that Jesus is worth everything. And I think what we try to do is we try to trim God down and go, you have this much. But he goes, no, no, if you're there at all, then your only response is to understand, I need to follow him completely. And so before I ask these three questions, I just want to tell you, if Jesus, if God, if faith are worth anything in your life, if there is any part of you whatsoever that goes, this real, this is real, this matters, this is significant, then you must continually push for, how can I continually turn myself over to God and submit myself to him? Like if Jesus has any impact on my life, then the smartest thing for me to do is to turn everything over to him because he's real and he's loving and he's there. So let me ask you a couple questions. First one is this. What are you hiding don't answer. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> what are you hiding? The reason why we hide sin, struggles, problems in our life is because we are more worried about public perception than private faith. The reason why we hide things in our lives is because we are far more worried about what people think than my personal relationship with God. What are you hiding? Again, this is not for you to share as a group, but it is for you to answer. And I think sometimes that we do a fantastic job of telling ourselves that we're not hiding anything. Whether it's actions, whether it's thoughts, all these different things in our life that keep us away from God. And we just go, oh, that's not a problem. That's not a big deal. That's not really there. We are fantastic. We are amazing deceivers of ourselves. But I think we need to ask this from time to time. What are we hiding? 
What are we attempting to keep from God? We know he knows, but we want to act like it's not there. It's really hard. Uh, we've got this weird thing in terms of how we understand faith today, and I won't take long on this. Um, the role of confession has always been a significant part of faith. And it's kind of lost in our culture today. And different groups view it as different things. Like if you have a Catholic background at all, part of your faith is you confess your sins to a priest, which is kind of this anonymous thing because you can't really see each other. At least that's what the mobster movies show me. You can't really see each other is how it works. And so it's just an interesting dynamic. Um, how, how Scripture tells us is it tells us something very simply, that if you confess your sins to God, he will forgive you. But if you want to be healed, you need to confess them to someone else. And you go, wow, that's scary. It is. It's very, very scary. But but that's what God tells us. Hey, as soon as you confess your sins to me, you're forgiven. Okay? I'm wiping it clean. You owe no one anything. But if you want it to stop, you need to confess it to someone else. And there is incredible power. There is, and, and I know for, if you're hearing, you're going, man, I know exactly what I'm hiding. And you're thinking, there is no way I'm going to let anyone know this. There is no way. There is incredible power in pulling out what was hidden in a closet in the darkness that you had swept under a rug hoping that no one would find it and bringing it out into the light to someone who can be trusted. Um, I deal with people often at the worst part of their lives oftentimes with mistakes that they have made themselves. I I can tell you this very simply. The people who get better quickest are the people who own their problems. Like that's the only factor that I worry about. Are are you truthful? Are you being honest? Are you telling the whole story? Because if you are, you're going to be fine. I don't care what family background, I don't care what history you have, I don't care if you're an angry person, if you're a shy person, if you're non-confrontational, none of those things matter. Are you willing to fully own where you are? Because if you are, you're going to be fine. If you're trying to hide stuff because you think it'll make you look bad, you're going to have a hard time. I'm not saying this to be harsh, I'm not saying this to be offensive, my goal is to be helpful in this moment. Second question, what are you rationalizing? What are you rationalizing? What do we continually tell ourselves? That's not a problem. That's not an issue. Or or this is my favorite part is um, sometimes when we open up scripture and look at the things it says, we go, yeah, I don't think that applies to me. It applies to them. It doesn't apply to me. Um, Let me give you a personal example of this to show you how easy it is. Um, So we have, um, me and my wife in our relationship, um, we have now kind of figured out the division of labor in our household. Married people, we understand this, right? The division of labor. You got this, I got this. We run, like, we tag team this one, and that's kind of how it works. That wasn't always the case in our relationship. And so, like, we didn't know who was doing what, who was doing different things. And so, um, and like, I was responsible for picking up. My wife was responsible for cleaning and dusting, which, I don't know, I felt like I got a bad shake on that, <laughs> Okay. And I felt like the cleaning and the dusting maybe was not happening on the timetable that I expected it to. And so we had a discussion. I was like, you always tell me to put away the dishes and to run the dishwasher and to put the dishes away, which I hate. And I don't feel like you ever dust. And she's like, no, I dust all the time. I dust every week. And I was like, no, you don't. Now, this is humorous now. At the time, it was not humorous. (laughs) No, you don't. You never dust. Yes, I do. I dust every week. I don't believe it. (laughs) And then we kind of went our different directions. And so, um, and so this is what I started to do is at first I started to like slack in my chores. I was like, she's not going to dust, I'm not going to put dishes away. Because that's kind and loving and what Jesus instructed us to do. Like, no, no, of course I didn't say that. And so this is what I eventually did, and this is a stupid, stupid decision, is, um, is I wrote the date in the dust on our piano. <laughs> And wouldn't you know it, Bethany dusted the next day. (laughs) And so she's going along, and I was at work, and she took a picture of this, and then all caps, what is this? Exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. And I was like, ah, that's nothing. I I was was just writing for fun. I was like, you wrote the date in it to see if I'd actually dust. Yeah, yeah, I did. (laughs) Um, But this this is the thing that I did that is so stupid along the way is I started rationalizing, not pulling my weight in the household, assuming that she wasn't doing hers. 
I think we do this all the time in different areas. Because you do this, I'm going to do this. Because you acted this way, I'm going to act as less than I know I should. Because you said this mean thing to me, I'm going to say this mean thing to you. And here's the issue, is that any time in any relationship or arena of our lives, if you have to attach an explanation to your decision, there's a problem. If any time, if someone would say, well, they did this, and you feel immediately the urge to come in. Well, you don't understand. You've got to understand the backstory in terms of how it played out. Well, Tina, she said this, and so I came here. If you ever have to do it, if you have to give the backstory, there's probably a problem. There it is. So what are you rationalizing? Whether it's your relationship with others, which affects your relationship with God, or directly your relationship with God. What are you rationalizing? And the third question is this. Where are you hesitating? Where are you hesitating? I think this is the hardest one. Delayed obedience is viewed by God as disobedience. It is. And and this is what I tell people. Any time I get a chance to teach a class, whether it's partnership class or starting point or anything like that that I get to be a part of, I always say this. This is the mark of spiritual maturity, is as soon as you figure out where God is leading you, you try to, as quick as you can, get to where that is. As soon as you think God is leading you any direction, you try to close that gap and make sure that you're right there. And we are filled with reasons. We're filled with rationalizations on that as to why now is not the best time. And I understand that. I get how that is so easy to get there. But guys, we've got to trust God in those moments. Um, Let me me give you this. Uh, When we bought the house that we're living in uh, right now, the circumstances were hilarious. We were living at a parsonage at another church that we were not allowed to live in anymore. That's another story. Um, But so we had to get out. And so we're trying to quickly, hurriedly find a house that we're going to buy. And so um, we found this house. We made an offer. They accepted it. We went down to the bank to get a loan. And I go down there. We're starting a church, okay? We have not yet started the church, but we are starting the church. We haven't had our first meeting. My wife is seven, six months pregnant, okay? And so I walk in there. She's six months pregnant. They go, what do you do? And I go, well, I'm a pastor. Oh, okay, what church? Well, it hasn't started yet. <laughs> okay, how are you going to make money? Well, people are going to give. Okay, do you have any giving records? Well, no, because we haven't started yet. But trust me, they're going to (laughs) give. And so they eventually, they just wiped me off the loan. That made me feel good as a man. (laughs) It was like, yeah, we're just going to disregard you and go with your wife's income. Thanks. (laughs) Nothing's more demasculating than that. (laughs) And so when we actually moved into our home, I kind of had this moment, stupid moment that I forgot stuff. And I was like, hey, so I bought you a house. No, you didn't. (laughs) I bought you a house. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Want to carry me across the threshold? (laughs) But here's the deal. In the moment, it was ridiculous. Like, it was was crazy because it was the worst time ever. But it was still the time that God was moving us, and it was the time that he acted. And I think that often happens. I think that God often calls us to step into our calling at the most inconvenient moments to show us if we actually trust him. And so here's my hope for you is that in your relationship with God, that you would be brutally honest with yourself, that you would be brutally honest, and that you would have the courage to ask the difficult, tough questions to find out if you really are, where you are, how things are going, where that is. So if you're not, um, I, I can remember this. When I was in middle school playing basketball, we ran suicides, and I was really slow. And, um, and I hated that. And so what I do, and some of you, you're going to, like, judge me for this, but I'm my own judge. You're your judge. There we go. And so we ran suicides, and I would always stop short of the line. I was. I was one of those guys. And I was like, man, I don't want to be the slowest person everywhere. Like, the centers, they're running faster than me. And they weigh, like, 50 pounds more than me. And so I'd stop just short of the line. And it helped me speed up a little bit. And my coach saw it, and he didn't call me out. He didn't scream at me. He pulled me aside at practice one day, and he looked at me, and he goes, I want you to know you're only cheating yourself. And that changed me. 
and I never did it again. Because I thought I was last. But he goes, no, you're cheating yourself. And that's the importance of honesty in our relationship with God. So that if we're not honest, we're only cheating ourselves. Because God is good, God is kind, God is gracious, and he knows what's best for us. And when we hide things, when we rationalize things, and when we hesitate, all it does is keep us from him. And he is good. So what are you hiding? What are you rationalizing? And where are you hesitating? Let me pray for us. Lord, in this uh, difficult morning and difficult message, my prayer is that we would find you. My prayer very, very simply, Lord, is that we would have the courage to be honest with ourselves. And so, Father, in this moment, we look to you. And ask that you would reveal things in our hearts and our heads that maybe we didn't know were there. That you would press us in areas of our lives in which maybe we thought we were fine or had convinced ourselves that we were fine. That we would have the courage to say, I'm not okay. That in this moment, things are not going how I expected them to or how I wanted them to. But most of all, Lord, help us to look to you. Help us to find you in this moment. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.